In the summer of 2020, the Shuttleworth Collection in Bedfordshire has been the focal point of British air shows with their innovative and popular drive-in event format. But while this year's shows may have been compromised on the ground, that was certainly not the case in the air, with five world-class aerial displays taking place between July and September. At the Vintage Air Show, the focus was on aircraft owned and flown by Richard Shuttleworth, the collection's founder. There were also tributes to the Miles Aircraft Company, such as this scintillating five-ship performance, a gaggle of other resident aircraft, such as the wonderful de Havilland Comet, and a gorgeous Spitfire and Hurricane pair paying tribute to the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. This is our pick of the action. Hello and welcome to the fourth and, as it turned out, the penultimate air show of the Shuttleworth Collection's 2020 season. It was Shuttleworth that, back in July, hosted the first drive-in air show in the world. And that format has worked exceptionally well here, with spectators parking up and watching the display from beside their cars. The vintage theme at this particular event will be focusing predominantly on aircraft that we didn't feature during our last visit to Shuttleworth, that was Series 2, Episode 5, and we start very fittingly with this three ship of aircraft, all of which were originally owned by Richard Shuttleworth. The Spartan Arrow, the DH-60X Moth, and the Dasuta. Where's the Arrow, I hear you ask? Well, there it is, just popping into shot at the end there. Always a little emotional when this aircraft returns to Shuttleworth, as it's owned today by Richard Blaine and based elsewhere. It was previously owned by Richard Shuttleworth between 1936 up until his death in 1940, but it's now been in the Blaine family for over half a century. The other two aircraft remain part of the collection today. He owned the De Sutter from 1935 onwards, that's the high-wing monoplane. process of elimination, the white biplane is the DH-60, the very aircraft on which Richard Shuttleworth learned to fly. It was also the first aeroplane he purchased as part of his collection back in 1932. He based his aeroplanes here at Old Warden, flying them from the gardens of his manor house, and that formed the basis for the modern-day Shuttleworth collection. Although he was tragically killed in August 1940 at the age of just 31, his legacy and many of his aircraft are still very much alive. But we focus for not tremendously long on this trio of Shuttleworth originals because we turn now to one of the afternoon's big set-piece displays, the Magic of Miles. The Southern Marklet leading the way, not technically a Miles aircraft, but designed by Frederick George Miles, who went on to create the Miles Aircraft Company several years later. With six built, this is the only surviving example, and it was actually F.G. Miles' personal aeroplane for some years. On either side of the formation, a Miles Magister one of the better-selling Miles designs. First flew in 1937, with just under 1,300 aircraft rolling off the production line. Well, 
most of which went to the Royal Air Force for use as a basic trainer, but it was also exported to 13 other military operators. At the back, the Hawk Speed 6, which is about to perform a solo display. This is the racing version of the Miles Hawk, a two-seat touring aeroplane produced by Miles. Just three Hawk Speed 6s were built. This particular one raced 13 times at the King's Cup Air Race, where it was the runner-up on four occasions. And today, it is the only Hawk Speed 6 still flying. Finally, you may have glimpsed it in the background earlier on, but this is the Miles Gemini, the final Miles aircraft to have been produced in significant numbers. Hundred and seventy of them to be precise between 1945 and 1947, at which point the company was unfortunately declared bankrupt. We stay with the Southern Martlet for a little longer, as the Martlet actually took part in three separate display slots throughout the day, and this is another of them, the Trailblazer segment with this civilian coupe. Trailing back to 1929, this is the only product of the civilian aircraft company, a two-seat monoplane with folding wings for easy storage. As far as we know, only five were built, and this is the sole survivor. It's operated today by Shipping and Airlines Limited and Biggin Hill. From one visiting aircraft to another, and we now have the sole contribution from the Royal Air Force, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Spitfire Mark 5B, making a couple of spirited flypasts. The Shuttleworth Collection provide the next two performances, but we stay with World War II fighters with the Gloucester Gladiator. Unlike the Spitfire, though, by the coming of war, the Gladiator was virtually obsolete. It gained a lot of bad press for its involvement in the Norwegian campaign in the spring of 1940, where it proved woefully inadequate against the might of the Luftwaffe, but nonetheless a very noble service career, perhaps epitomised during the siege of Malta, when a tiny fleet of gladiators were the island's sole defence from invasion. They faced far more advanced and more numerous aircraft from the Italian Air Force, but still pulled through. is uh, a true testament to the skill, bravery and tactics employed by those that flew them. Certainly not a fighter, but an aircraft of comparable era, the Lysander. It was originally intended as a multi-role ground support aircraft, but like the Gladiator, it was very soon obsolete. it forged an alternative career transporting spies to and from enemy territory in occupied France. To do this, the aircraft operated under cover of darkness, that's why it's painted black, it used very short improvised airstrips. And while we can't show you its short field capabilities in this video, we can give you a glimpse of just how slowly this aeroplane can fly in this low speed pass. A very aerodynamically advanced aircraft with automatic slats, for example, 
which give it a stalling speed of just 56 knots. Sticking with the Second World War, here's Plain Sailing's PBY-5A Catalina. An aircraft that's been getting out and about on the display circuit quite a bit this year, all things considered, even doing a couple of foreign shows. The Catalina was used in a number of roles, from search and rescue to firefighting. Indeed, it remains in service as a firefighter in some parts of the world today. But perhaps most famously, it was a sub-hunter, and in that role, two Catalina pilots were actually awarded the Victoria Cross. That's the highest award for bravery and valour in the Commonwealth. VC is not typically awarded to aircrew as there's an element of self-preservation involved in uh, saving an aircraft but two VCs were given to Catalina pilots for pressing home their attack under extremely heavy fire and weather permitting if the Duxford Showcase Day goes ahead in October we'll talk about one of those stories in the next episode of Airshow Dispatches. So as that aircraft departs off slot back to Duxford, our next display item is the Stomp Formation Flying Team. This is a team we've seen a couple of times before on this programme, albeit either flying a reduced number of aircraft or facing less than perfect weather conditions. So lovely to see all four of their brightly coloured aeroplanes standing out so nicely against the glorious blue sky that we so much enjoyed on Sunday the 6th of September in Bedfordshire. Team is based down at Headcorn Aerodrome in Kent, and as the more astute of you may have guessed by now, they fly the SV4 Stomp. The Belgian Ballerina, as it's sometimes known, designed in Belgium as a training and touring aeroplane in the early 1930s. It didn't see much success though until after the Second World War, when a run of over 900 licensed built aeroplanes far surpassed the original production run of just 35. Indeed, by the end of the war, only one of those original aircraft survived, but luckily there are plenty flying today. Now the team pull up for the Prince of Wales break. Chris Jessen will now perform a solo display showing off the remarkable manoeuvrability of this aircraft. You probably would not think, looking at it, that the Stomp is capable of a flick roll, for example, but look at this. Lovely stuff, and now continuing in on the B-axis for loop. Somewhat unusually for designs of that era, the aircraft has ailerons on both the top and the bottom wings, and they're freeze ailerons, that is, when they're deflected, the leading edge of the aileron protrudes slightly in the opposite direction to that deflection. That helps reduce adverse yaw, so those ailerons take a lot of credit for the Stomp's surprisingly carefree handling.
They aren't doing much work in this particular manoeuvre, a very impressive inverted 360 degree turn. I just think Chris Jessen's stomp solo is a sublime piece of flying, utterly mesmerizing to watch and surprising given the appearance of the airframe as well. And this performance, Graham saw in the LF-107 Lunac, exhibits all those same qualities. It's not loud, it's not particularly close, but it just captured everyone's attention from start to finish. converting some of his height into speed, then back into height again. And now he'll dive down towards the crowd and fly not one, not two, but three flick rolls. I've seen a lot of glider displays over the last few years and I don't think I've ever seen one that ends like that. And here's something else I most definitely haven't seen before. The Fobel starting its display and you'll never guess who's flying formation on him. Yep, it's the Piper Cub tow plane. Probably with the power almost back at idle. Tow rope still attached, you can see it in some of these shots. And I just bet whoever's in that Piper Cub has a bit of a grin on their face as they look out the window and think, would you look at that, I am flying formation on a glider. That can't be something that one does all that often. Now from the sublime to the fast and the furious. But still to the very graceful with this pair of classic racers. In the lead, the world's only flying de Havilland DH-88 Comet, built just down the road at Hatfield. The smaller aircraft alongside it is the Percival Mew Gull, consistently one of the most successful racing aeroplanes of the 1930s, racking up six wins at the King's Cup Air Race. the original five aeroplanes. One is on display at the RAF Museum in Hendon. This is the sole airworthy example, although it has been almost completely rebuilt on more than one occasion. And there's also an airworthy replica of one of the original aeroplanes as well, and that's also based here in the UK. iconic, much more recognisable are the unmistakable lines of the de Havilland Comet, an aircraft developed specifically for the 1934 Robinson Air Race from England to Australia. Three Comets were built for the race, with two more being built subsequently. Type made its first flight only six weeks before that competition, but nonetheless, one of them was the eventual winner, setting a time of 70 hours, 54 minutes, and 18 seconds. And not just anyone, but in fact, the very one that you are watching right now, which is also the only original comet still flying.
another Percival design, albeit a very different one now, the Provost T-1, a military training aircraft of the early 1950s. Later adapted to make use of a jet engine, and in doing so it became the Royal Air Force's first jet trainer, the Jet Provost. So, you may wonder, what's going on with the paint scheme? If it's a trainer, especially a Royal Air Force trainer, why the camouflage? That's just not what the RAF do. Well, eight other countries have operated the Provost, several of which actually use the type operationally. And as for the Royal Air Force roundels, they were required to be worn on the delivery flights when the aircraft was still technically in British hands. So the rather unorthodox paint scheme is sort of justified. As this is a Shuttleworth air show, it'd be remiss of us not to feature their wonderful First World War aeroplanes, even if we're going to do so very briefly. And that's because we have seen all of these aircraft flying in a very similar combination and in better weather conditions back at the Shuttleworth Military Air Show 2019. That show is the subject of Airshow Dispatches Series 2, Episode 5, in which we feature all of these aircraft quite extensively. So do head to our website or YouTube channel to find that production. And while you're there, you may also stumble across longer, unnarrated videos giving you a look at some of these individual performances. So those are well worth a look as well. Certainly one of the highlights of the Vintage Air Show was this tribute to the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain with a pairing of Hawker Hurricane Mark 1R4118 and the collection's own Supermarine Spitfire Mark V, AR-504. start their display with several close formation flybys before moving into a wonderfully choreographed sequence of simultaneous solo displays, the latter lasting for a good 10 minutes. An absolute treat to watch as the sun re-emerged for these final few moments of the flying display. Hurricane is one we've featured on this programme before, a real-life Battle of Britain veteran, in fact. The only Battle of Britain Hurricane still flying today. It flew some 49 sorties in the battle, claiming five enemy aircraft before it itself was shot down. then spent many decades out in India before being rescued and restored by Peter Vasher, who is now owned by James Brown, based here at Old War. Spitfire, meanwhile, was built in 1942 by Westland, based just up the road at Duxford, a name that is, I'm sure, familiar. that aircraft was used as an escort fighter escorting US Army Air Force bombers deep into enemy territory. It was restored to take part in the Battle of Britain film in 1970 and has been a much loved airshow performer ever since then.
coincidence at all that both Spitfires we've seen today are Mark Vs. That is, after all, the most produced Mark of the Spitfire. One big difference between the two, though, the BBMF's aeroplane had the Spitfire's classic elliptical wing, whereas this one has been retrofitted after the war with clipped wingtips, which give the aircraft a far superior roll rate, as well as very slight speed advantage at lower altitudes. A lot of people absolutely hate those clipped wings and say trashing the elliptical wing of a Spitfire should be a crime, but between you and me, I actually prefer it. Such a sleek looking aeroplane. We conclude the vintage air show with the Shuttleworth Edwardians. And watch now for one of those incredible only at Shuttleworth moments. The Bristol box kite performing something of an opposition pass with the Avro triplane. And you won't see that being performed anywhere else in the world. This was the first and probably the final time that the Edwardians have been displayed in 2020. They need absolutely perfect weather conditions to fly. Technically, both of these aeroplanes are replicas built for the 1965 film Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines. But this one is an original, the Blackburn Type D monoplane, hailing back to 1912, one of the world's oldest flying aeroplanes. But not the oldest. That is a Blerio aircraft, also owned by the Shuttleworth Collection, but not flying here today. It is, however, the oldest aeroplane of British origin flying anywhere in the world. The restoration was started by Richard Shuttleworth himself all the way back in 1937, but not completed until after his death in 1949, and it's become one of the Shuttleworth Collection's most prized possessions ever since then. And with that, we conclude our look back at the Shuttleworth Vintage Air Show 2020 and cast our eyes forward to Duxford Showcase Day number three, which will be our final episode of Air Show Dispatches this series. That film is coming very soon, but until then, from me, Adam Landau, thank you very much for joining me. It's goodbye for now. <laughs>